Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. So good to see you all here this morning. Amen. In the house of the Lord and all of you tuned in online. Amen. So good to see you all. Hallelujah. How many ready for a word today? We have a word from God. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's go to Mark chapter 11. Start reading there for you in verse 21. Amen. We thank Pastor Miz for his wonderful message last Sunday. Amen. Right? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You got to stretch your faith. Amen. We're going to continue in that vein of faith today. It seems to be where the Lord has us at this moment. And that's, that's important to take pay attention to because that means our faith needs to be increased. Ah, something might be here. Something's coming where we're going to need more faith in God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Mark chapter 11, starting verse 21, Peter calling to remembrance, he said unto him, him being Jesus, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. Jesus answered and said unto him, Have faith in God. Jesus continued to say, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he says, it shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Our topic is simple today. But important it is this faith to move your mountains faith to move your mountains you may be seated here in the house of the Lord those that are tuning in online we thank you for tuning in we understand there's people tuning in amen all over the country and perhaps the world and we welcome you here to the North Park Apostolic Church and to all of our guests amen God bless you amen for everyone who's, uh, coming and, and becoming our guest today. We thank God for you. In this scripture text today, we, we see Jesus as he is really in the last week of his life before going to the cross. And the day earlier, Jesus on his way to the temple, he saw a fig tree that he was hoping there would be some fruit on. And there wasn't any figs on it. And so he cursed it to die. The second day when they came through there, Peter was amazed that uh, he remembered what Jesus had said to the fig tree. And sure enough, it had withered away even to its roots. Peter then rehearses that to Jesus. He says, you know, the fig tree you cursed yesterday is now withered away. And Jesus gives this answer, have faith. In God. I imagine that Peter, Peter and the disciples had some amazement about how fast the tree could die. But Jesus' response is to have faith in God. And then Jesus goes on and, amen, shows them a mountain and says, You can say to that mountain to be removed and cast into the sea. And if you do not doubt in your heart, you shall believe those things. It shall come to pass. Jesus has given us some valuable principles here about how to exercise faith. And so that's really what this, this series, I guess, we're in is all about, is to increase our faith. But notice Jesus makes mention of a mountain. And so life has many mountains for us to overcome. The great thing here is that no matter what mountain comes up in your life, Christ has told us that we can command it to move and it'll move. Mountains are obstacles. They are things that get in the way of where we are going. The principle here then is to get rid of the mountains in our life that we must have faith 
in God. Faith must be in God and not in the mountain. The mountain is a distraction. And so what a mountain does, because it's such a large object, if you will, then it is a thing that attracts our attention. So we focus more on the mountain. We focus more on the problem. We focus more on the obstacle. We focus more on what is in the way of our intended goal instead of focusing on Christ. Faith can only come in God. Amen. If you have faith in yourself, it's very limited. It's only going to take you so far. But having faith in God does not have any limits to it. And we have to understand that Christ, amen, this is what he does. Amen. He moves when we move by having faith in him. It's who God is. It's what God does. He, he moves according to our level of faith. Jesus said to Peter, say to this mountain. A mountain in our life, like I said, is an obstacle. It is something that is in the way of our intended goal or our intended purpose. doesn't matter what that goal and purpose is, but things are going to come to block us from moving forward. I don't know what the mountain is in your life or what the goal is in your life. The goal is... It could be healing, that you need a healing for your body or a healing for someone who is attached to you that you care about. It could be relational, a relationship that is important to you is struggling and, and a mountain has risen up. Uh, it could be a personal vision for your life or a personal vision from God for your life. The goal could be even financial, but Mountains keep rising up and you can't meet that, that financial goal. The problems to all goals in life and, and, and things that God has called us to do is that mountains are going to rise up and be in your way. If you notice just in the natural, if you've ever been on any kind of a, a road trip, you'll notice that when you come upon a mountain, there was a decision that had to be made by the one laying the road or the engineer that, amen, had the plan to lay the road. And I've noticed that they've handled certain mountains different ways. Some, if the land was available, they simply went around the mountain. Others, uh, they actually went through the mountain, and that's when you are driving through a long tunnel. You are actually in the mountain getting through it. Or sometimes you have to overcome the mountain. In other words, they'll create a road that usually zigzags so it's not too hard on your car to get you to the top of the mountain. And the same thing happens on the other side so you don't speed down the mountain. They have to find a way to make it safe for you to get past the mountain. And so what we see in life is that mountains rise up and get in our way. Some mountains you can see from a distance. You know the mountain is coming, and so you try to prepare for it. But some mountains just show up. I call this the unexpected mountains. There are certain things in life we do expect to happen. You have a goal, you expect there's going to be some obstacle, and oftentimes you can predict what that obstacle will be. But there's going to be times when obstacles will just rise up in one day. Amen. One doctor's report, one something, amen. And now you have a mountain in front of you that you did not expect. And so it's when that happens that mountains come to discourage us. And they can distract us. And that is because we then give the mountain too much attention. When we give the mountain too much attention, it causes us to pause or even stop from moving forward. And that is when we must realize that I need a higher level of faith. You see... Faith for your goal is not enough. In other words, when the Lord drops a goal in your life or you're inspired by the Lord, amen, you have faith to step out in that goal. But that first step of faith is never going to be enough faith. You have to have faith for the unexpected challenges that will come. Your faith will be tested. And how many times have someone stepped out in faith, amen, but did not continue in faith, so the goal was never achieved. 
I want to use an example of this principle. Uh, what Jesus is dropping on us here in Mark 11, he's showing us some principles that need to be applied in order for faith to be exercised. If we're going to move mountains and speak to mountains and tell mountains to be moved, he, he gives us the principles necessary to move a mountain. And so we see these principles throughout Scripture. These principles apply to whenever anyone in Scripture had a mountain in their life and they had to overcome it. The example I'm going to use today, because it's pretty common, and most people know the story of David versus Goliath. This story comes out of 1 Samuel 17, but the mountain here was a man called Goliath, a Philistine, who was a warrior. He was the best that the Philistines had. Believed, he was believed to be about nine to nine and a half feet tall. You talk about a mountain. Amen. He had all on armor and spears and had an armor bearer. Amen. And he's coming before Israel, the armies of Israel, and King Saul. It was important for God that the armies of Israel overtake the Philistines. But instead, this mountain would come and mock the, the army of Israel and mock King Saul and actually curse Israel and curse God. What happened was that, that there was no battle taking place. For the army of Israel and King Saul had focused on the mountain called Goliath and they stagnated. They did not pursue in battle. And that is an indicator of a need for increased faith. You see, stagnation often leads to excuses. We, we'll come up with a reason why. We begin to doubt whether we should have been on this journey in the first place. And so this is when you know you need increased faith is when the excuses begin. So what mountains do is they kind of let you know where your level of faith is. They let you know that, uh oh, I've reached a ceiling in my faith in God and it's time for me to break through the ceiling and grow. The problem here is this mountain called Goliath have seemed to have created a stagnation for Israel that lasted 40 days. Scripture tells us that Goliath mocked for 40 days. Every morning, every evening, he would come out and make a challenge, and all they could see was the power of Goliath instead of seeing the power of God, and now 40 days have gone by. You would think that somebody would rise up and say, you know what, this is long enough. Okay, we've been out here listening to him for 40 days. It's time for us to do something. And whether I die, then I die. But we got to do something. But no, that's not what happened. They were operated in fear and terror for 40 days. And it's bad when your mountain mocks you. It tears down the, the faith that you did have. And cause you to question. And that's what Goliath would do. And he was mocking. The mountains in your life will continue to mock you. And they will mock your God. If you don't do something against it. You see mocking causes us to doubt. And when we begin to doubt God. We have now have faith that is eroding and decreasing. This is what will cause fear in our life. Because if you doubt God, then now it comes down to your own ability. Your own self-sufficiency. And your own self-sufficiency is always going to come up less than the mountain ahead of you. We must understand that we have God to help us. But if our God can be mocked and we believe it, now we don't even depend on God. So the Lord has a question for us before we move on. How long has a mountain in your life mocked you and mocked your God? You see, the devil brings doubt about God being on your side. You begin to doubt about God being on your side. You wonder, did God leave you? You wonder if God, amen, has abandoned you. And, and now that mocking that you hear is starting to affect even your relationship with God. But Jesus gives us the principle. 
He told Peter and the disciples, say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. <laughs> That's a wonderful principle of faith. Because what it says, that you must speak it first and then see what you have spoken. It seems simple. But here's the thing. Oftentimes we are afraid to speak it. And even if we did, we don't really see it. But amen, you got to have faith. That amen says to your mountain, you got to be moved. And then you got to see it being moved where you want it to be moved to. He says, say to it, be moved and thrown into the sea. But you got to say it and you got to see it. And that is an act of faith. You see, the mocking mountain will tell you, don't say it because you're going to look like an idiot. You will look like a fool when I don't move. But faith is going to say it anyway. Faith is going to say, I'm going to say it because God has shown me that this is a principle of faith in order for you to come down. Let's go back to David. David saw God more than he saw Goliath. He knew Goliath was in front of him. He could see his stature. He could see his strength. But he saw God greater than this mountain called Goliath. And so David used this principle. He spoke it and he saw it. Notice then what it says in 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47. Then said David to the Philistine. I love this. You come to me with a sword and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. That's saying some stuff. That's speaking faith. That's saying, I see God greater than you, Goliath. You might be greater than me, but you're not greater than the God I serve. Watch what David said. This is some bold stuff. He says, this day will the Lord deliver you into my hand. And I will smite you. I'll take your head from you. And I'll give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Notice what he did. He said it and he saw it. It'd be one thing to say, I'm going to kill you. But he said, it's going to go down like this. I'm going to kill you. And then when you go down, I'm going to take your head off. Amen. And then I'm going to leave your body there. And I'm going to allow the birds and all the bees to come. And they're going to have a buffet on your nine foot body. And then all the earth will know that God is with us. Do you understand that God is with you? That he chose you before the foundation of the world? That he loved you enough to go to Calvary for you? And when he went to that cross, he was thinking of you. Amen. That he has delivered you from sin. He's given you his righteousness. Amen. Why would Christ do all that for you and then back up and let you go? No, he's using you as a testimony of faith to the world. That you have the power in Christ to bring down mountains. He went on to say, and all of this assembly shall know that the Lord saves, not with a sword and with a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David said it, and he saw it. And so why? Because David saw God greater than the mountain. See, David found a way, even though that mountain was big and right here in his face, he saw a way around the mountain. He saw the victory on the other side of the mountain. You see, mountains are just obstacles in our life. 
Sometimes, amen, you bring them down by just going around them. Sometimes God will just give you wisdom how to handle this mountain. And next thing you know, you're looking back and say, oh, I got past the mountain. Because God always will find a way. His ways are past finding out. We always try to figure it out ourselves. How am I going to get past this mountain? But if you learn to just give it to God, amen, God will give you the formula. He'll give you the directions to get around your mountain. That changes the perspective on the mountain. That all a mountain is is something that we are to maneuver around with a minimal amount of distraction so I can get focused on the goal that is at hand. When you no longer see a mountain as an obstacle, amen, instead of seeing it as something to just move around, now you're operating in faith. But do you know it's not just mountains? As you come up on your mountain, do you know that mountains have hills? Yeah, they're called foothills. And you have to overcome foothills before you overcome the mountain. And so before David could go and speak to Goliath, he had to deal with the hills that came against him. There were two hills that I recognize in Scripture. One was from his oldest brother, Elias. And Elias said to David, why are you even here? Did you just come to watch and be a busybody? Right? And, and since you're here, who's taking care of your little flock of sheep since you're not with them right now? And that's important for us to understand because here's what will happen. When you speak to your mountain, you've got to have your faith in God. And so sometimes what we do is we try it out on somebody else. You know what? I'm going to do this. And they're going to tell you, no, you're not. You never did that before. Are you sure God told you to do that? It sounds to me like whatever road you're on now that God never told you to go on in the first place. You sure it wasn't just you, amen, going forward? And it wasn't God? Those are the hills. Those are the little hills that come with mountains. And then even King Saul says to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine. You're so young and you're so inexperienced. And Goliath, he's been a warrior since he's been your age. And now you're just showing up and you've never even fought one battle out here in the battlefield. And you think you're going to take down their champion? Yeah, mountains have hills. Which means this, you got to be careful who you speak to. You better be intact with your relationship with God and know, amen, what God told you to do. And speak to your mountain and command it to come down. Because the heels of the mountain will also attack your faith. I can remember when I first came to the Lord, amen, over 30 years ago, amen. It felt so good to be saved and amen and, and, and born again and, you know, no desire for sin. Amen. This is called the innocent stage. I was innocent. And I just believe that everybody loved God in the church. And that we were all perfect and we're just waiting around to go to heaven. And then I found out that, you know, saints still cuss and, and cuss other people out and will put you in your place because you sat on their pew. I've been in this seat 20 years. You can't sit here, brother. What is this? And so I began to realize that I was going to have to grow in God. Amen. And that I began to realize after the innocent stage that I wasn't so perfect either. Amen. Because there are some people in the church I wanted to cuss out. <laughs> and I began to realize I, I need to grow in God. I, I need to have a greater faith. And so I learned that if I'm going to speak something out that... I needed to make sure that it was someone that God put in my life to do so. That I could acquire wisdom from someone who has already dealt with this mountain in their life and now I'm dealing with it. Thank you, Jesus. But Jesus, when he says this to Peter, going back to Mark 11, he says, Verily I say unto you, say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. And then he says this principle. And shall not doubt in 
his heart. But shall believe those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. That's so valuable. We often read over it, but he says, you cannot doubt in your heart. Let's go back to David. David applied this principle. Heart has to do with your relationship with God. And so when you have to go to another level of faith and you're being mocked and torn down and told you can't do it and all that, amen, David had to pull on his relationship with God in order to convince those around him that he was ready to take on this mountain called Goliath. When King Saul told him, you can't do this, you've never been a warrior, you've never been a fighter, you're just a young kid, how are you going to fight against the very best? Then David had to pull on his relationship with God. Instead of doubting in his heart, amen, he had to remind him, wait a minute, let me tell you about my walk with God. One time a bear and a lion came against me and came against my sheep. And so what I did is I rose up and I grabbed them and I knocked them out and then I killed them. That's my walk with God. That's my relationship with God. And so for as this Philistine, what is he going to do against what God can do through me? My, my, my. You see, you have to have your own walk with God, your own relationship with God, your own victories with God, and you need to rehearse them often, how the mountains that you've already had in your life, how God got you through those trials, those heartaches, those pains. God was right there with you. So that when you see a mountain that you've never had to tackle before, you can pull on your relationship with God. And it won't cause doubt in your heart. Thank you, Jesus. So he says, believe those things which you speak in faith. Believe those things which you speak and see it happen. Oh, yes. And so you know what? We don't speak enough. We're pretty good at doubting. We're pretty good at questioning. But can we get to a place where we just speak first? Oh, no, this thing can't be in my way. And then speak to it in the name of the Lord. You see, here's what David did. I love this. David ran toward Goliath. He ran toward his mountain. Amen. David ran toward Goliath. He pulled out a smooth stone. He put it in his sling. Amen. And he walked up on him and slung it. And boom, the battle was over that fast. It's amazing when sometimes I've seen movies about the story of David and Goliath. And they actually try to turn it into a battle. You know, they try and turn it into David. I mean, Goliath swinging at David. And David, you know, dodges out of the way. And then David runs to the river and gets a rock. And Goliath is chasing him. They, you know, that's Hollywood. They try and make it bigger than Scripture gave it to be. But I want you to know, this wasn't really a battle. Amen. It was a battle of faith, but the actual battle wasn't anything. David picked up a stone, started running toward Goliath, slung it. Amen. The stone hit him in the forehead, and he went down. David ran up on his body, took his sword out because he didn't have a sword. Amen. And took his head off, raised up his head, and the story's over. Battle's done. That's how fast mountains can come down. But you got to have faith to run towards your mountain instead of running the other way. Him taking Goliath's head off means this, that you will never rise up in my life again. And that's what God is telling us. That mountain that just came down has no power against me ever again. Thank you, Jesus. As a side note here, I want you to know that all David used was a rock. <laughs> Scripture tells us, though, that Jesus is our rock. So when we go to battle to take on our mountain, and, and all we have is us, all we have is the gifts God gave us, all we have is the talent God gave us, all we have is the experiences of our life, and it seems like that is not going to be enough for this mountain, understand this. You have the weaponry of Jesus being your rock. So sometimes you got to speak that out too to increase your faith. Psalms 18 and 2 says this. The Lord is my rock 
in my fortress, in my deliverer, in my God, in my strength, in whom I will trust. He's my buckler and the horn of my salvation, and he's my high tower. You see how the psalmist personalized that? When we go to face our mountains, we got to remind ourselves that God is on our side. Amen. And you know what? You got to say it with attitude. You can't say it, well, the Lord is, man, I hope he is my rock. And I, I, I'm just going to say it. I believe he's my fortress and, and he's my deliverer. Oh, God, please deliver me. Please deliver me. Be my... No, you got to have some attitude. Tired of this mountain. Don't you know that God chose me? I know God as my rock. And when you come against me, you come against my God. I'm talking my God. I'm talking about your testimony, what you have gone through, what God has done for you. Who wants to do some declaration right now? Now, if you're going to declare with me right now with an attitude, that means you got to get up on your feet. And just repeat after me. The Lord is my rock. And my fortress. And my deliverer. He's my God. He's my strength. He's the one I trust in. He's my buckler. He's the horn of my salvation. And he is my high tower. That's who your God is. Hallelujah. Thank you. Mm. I can see your mountain already crumbling. I can see an earthquake happening underneath your mountain right now. Amen. Now your mountain is afraid because your mountain understands that you know who God is in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Yeah, you got to say to him, yeah, I said it. Yeah, I said it. That's who my God is in my life. So you got to go. You got to come down. You got to get out of my way. All right, I'm not done. Sit down. Sit down. You know what we got to learn to do? Learn how to exercise the rock. Jesus is the rock in your life. Learn how to exercise the rock. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. My, my, my. All I'm doing is exercising the rock. Hallelujah. So Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you have received them, and you shall have them. This, this is where we have to increase our faith before we get to the mountain. Notice what he says. We like to hear whatever you desire. If you believe and receive it, you shall have them. But he says something really important. He says, when you pray. Uh-oh. There's the principle that we have to be prayed up before the mountain shows up. See, we usually do the opposite. We kind of hit and miss in our prayer until there's a mountain. Then when the mountain shows up, ooh, I got to pray, I got to pray. Now all of a sudden you in a prayer life. All of a sudden you getting up early in the morning. Oh God, I need you, I need your help. There's a mountain in the way. You know what he says? Be prayed up already. My, my, my. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Pastor Miz just taught on this Wednesday. But in his Wednesday Bible study, he said something real important. And it was this. That when Jesus came up on stuff where they needed a miracle to be done, Notice he didn't spend a lot of time in prayer. He just spoke it. You know why? He had already spent time in prayer. So when you spend time in prayer, when your mountain shows up, amen, you can handle it in the moment. 
We don't handle mountains in the moment. They end up being extended because we haven't been prayed up. So now we got to pull back and get our prayer life together to handle the mountain. But mountains are only made to be handled for the moment because we've already been prayed up. Woo! My, my, my. We have to establish a prayer life of dependence on Christ that increases our faith because he says whatever you desire when you pray and you believe in your prayer that you receive them, Jesus says you shall have them. Which means this, that it doesn't matter the obstacles that get in our way. We can achieve every goal, every purpose, every plan, every walk, every calling that Christ has given you through prayer. My. You see, it was going good until we get to this, this point. Because Jesus, you know, we don't usually read on, but Jesus was still in the middle of his thought. He says, so when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any. That your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Which begs the question of this, is how many times is what we think our faith to bring down mountains, and it's not bringing down the mountains, is really a forgiveness issue. Because we're harboring something against somebody. Whew. Because how can God honor that? Watch this. It took faith to come to the Lord. It took faith to repent. It took faith to ask, to tell the Lord and, and let him know that you want him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, right? It took faith to be baptized in his name. All of that took faith. Your, your initial relationship with Christ took faith. And then we get to a place in that starting of faith where we lose faith, even to the point where we harbor resentment against people and unforgiveness. That means we've gone back to the place before we were born again. Oh. This is a tough scripture. Because there's a lot of people that believe, uh-uh, the Lord knows because what that person did to me was so hard. I'm just having a tough time forgiving them. Yes, forgiveness is tough. And you got to have faith in Christ to forgive. But understand this. He forgave you. He forgave me when he went to the cross and shed his blood. Amen. And they put thorns in his head and nails in his hands and feet. And he suffered on that cross hanging in agony. He did that for us. It takes faith to say, Lord, I forgive this one for hurt, hurting me. And oftentimes, let's be real, the forgiveness is necessary to some of the closest people to us. Oh, it might be somebody in your house. Uh-oh. The mountain might be your marriage. That was not in my notes. That was a... And so you got to forgive Daily. Sometimes your mountain is so big, you got to forgive every hour. Uh-oh. Just excuse yourself from the argument. This means, excuse me, I'm leaving. And go in the bathroom and forgive them again for the tenth time today. Uh and you can take down any mountain. Any mountain. So the Lord has shared the principles with us of what it takes to take down the mountains in our life. Amen. Faith to move your mountains. Can you give the Lord a hand praise for his word today? Let us pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We just thank you so much for your word today. Lord, help us to apply these principles to our lives so that we can bring down these mountains. Lord, mountains, we understand, are always going to rise up. And the ones that seem to shake us the most are the unexpected ones. 
But Lord, help us to look at you and follow the principles of your word to bring down every mountain so we can continue on the journey that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, we pray that they would come forward in repentance. Oh, God, they be baptized in your name. You promise them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, we thank you for your word today. And so, Lord, I pray this word, my God, will bring forth fruit in everyone's lives that hears it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. As we get ready to take our offering and dismiss, we do have a couple of announcements. So if you pay attention to the video screen, amen, for these announcements. Good morning, North Park. We hope that you have enjoyed the service today and that your faith has been increased and you are determined to stay with God. Here are your announcements for the week. The U.S. Coast Guard will celebrate 231 years of service on August 4th. Happy birthday, yep. U.S. Coast Guard, and we thank you for your service. Please come back tonight for good word and testimony right here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Hey, what's up, everybody? Pastor Miz here with a quick announcement to all the men. Next Saturday, August 7th, 10 a.m., right here at the park, we're going to be having a men's fellowship meeting dealing with that topic of the hour, religion versus relationship. You already know this is going to be a topic that serves as great communication and dialogue. And listen, we just want to come together, fellowship, break bread, and part into one another and just enjoy brethren dwelling together in unity. So next Saturday, August 7th, 10 a.m., right here at the park in the fellowship hall, light refreshments will be served and we wanna see all the men there. God bless you, God keep you. We'll see you next Saturday. Please remember to stay safe, sanitized and prayed up. Love God, love others, serve others and share the gospel. Pastor Eddie B signing off. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Eddie and Pastor Miz, for those messages. Vitally important. Amen. So kingdom men, we're men of the kingdom of God. Remember, amen. We have a fellowship meeting next Saturday, 10 a.m. right here in the fellowship hall. I'm looking forward to that because iron sharpens iron. Amen. All right. How many are you ready to give today in our offering? Amen. <clears throat> If you want prayer today, you want special prayer, then after the offering, just go back to your seat. And then uh, after everyone's been dismissed, we'll ask you to come down and we will pray for you. You need increase in faith. You want to speak out. Amen. Against some mountains in your life. Come on down and do that before the Lord. We'll be happy to join with you in prayer. Amen. In that. And so, amen. Please, we, we, we take prayer important here. And so we want to offer you that altar time uh, if so needed. Amen. In our offering today, uh, as you come around, uh, just come around as you normally do. You'll be led by the ushers. But instead of going out the side door, just go ahead and go down that wall over there and go out the back doors, the same door as you came in. Amen. So, amen. You don't mess up your nice shoes. Amen. On the grass. Amen. So just go on down. Amen. Down the side wall there as you exit. We thank you all for your continued giving. We thank you for your faithfulness in God. Uh, I can tell you, uh, since the pandemic has started, and, and here we are, we're still in it, but uh, your, your giving says something about your heart for God, which is relationship. Amen. Have you noticed that uh, I haven't had to preach a message on giving? Yeah, you know, when a preacher preaches a message on giving, that means that people aren't giving. So he's led of the Lord to preach on it. Amen. But I haven't had to do that. Because your, your giving has exceeded the expectations that even we have had. That says something about your heart with God. Amen. Give yourselves a hand. That's awesome. So please continue to do so. I know you're blessed because of it. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to give and to give unto you for the building of your kingdom. And Lord, continue to use us 
to impact our community. Oh God, to love you, love others, and to uh, share the gospel, Lord. We use this to share the gospel. We use this to serve those in our community who come, Lord, with whatever need they have. We do our very best. We thank you for using us, oh God, using us, this collective group of people that is your body, to help the needs of others. Bless the gift and the giver today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming today and know that we love you.